So Dave Moskowitz, Toko Inoa. I'm Dave Moskowitz here uh, representing EdTech NZ. And we'll wait just a minute while people come into the room. Thank you very much for uh, coming to be with us on a Friday afternoon. Uh, it is drinks o'clock at the end of uh, what's been a really interesting week, uh, Tech Week. It's been a fantastic week this week. Uh, I don't know about other people, but uh, you know, just the events that I've seen and been part of uh, really indicate that the uh, tech scene in New Zealand and EdTech in particular are really alive and well and doing amazing things. So um, while we're waiting for people to come into the room, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about EdTech NZ. Now, our purpose is to empower learning with technology that embodies our unique Aotearoa New Zealand identity. EdTech NZ is part of the New Zealand Tech Alliance, and our members comprise large and small companies from right across the sector and up and down the Motu. And if you want to play an active role in helping improve Aotearoa New Zealand's education technology scene, then do join us. Um, you can sign up at edtechnz.org.nz slash join, or just go to the homepage, edtechnz.org.nz. Um, you can join our mailing list for free, so you can be part of our community and uh, keep up with what's going on. We also have meetups in uh, Wellington, uh, Auckland, and Christchurch. So um, if you want to join one of those meetups and interact on a somewhat irregular basis uh, with your edtech peers, uh, we'd really love to have you along to those. Now, my co-host today is Truman Pham from the uh, Mind Lab, and um, how would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself in the Mind Lab, Truman? You need to unmute yourself first, though. Oh, good. Hello, everyone. My name is Truman Pham, and I'm an online educator at the Mind Lab. Um, I'm ha very happy to be here to uh, be the co-host of this event. Thank you very much, Dave, for this series. Um, Thank you. Cool. So thanks very much, Truman. And um, today we're talking to six really exciting companies based right here in Aotearoa. And they're doing cool stuff that's transforming the face of education in New Zealand, and as you'll see, around the world as well. So today we'll be talking to uh, Lane Litz from Chatterize, who are helping young Chinese English learners improve their pronunciation and grammar. We'll talk to Megan Maffey from Digital Badge Ed, who provide easy to use digital badges that improve learning and life outcomes for kids. We'll be talking to Judith Cambridge from Accounting Pod, who are giving accounting students real life accounting experience. Uh, Rodney Tamblin from OB3 Ocean Browser, who provide course authoring and collaboration tools for higher education. Um, Kyle Webster from LitMaps, who are using network science to accelerate the expansion of what we collectively know about the world. And we'll finish up with Ali Mazra from Adri, who are restoring Arabic as a first class language of scientific research and discourse from New Zealand. Uh, these founders are really pushing the boundaries of what education in the digital world can be and what it must become. Now, each company has prepared a brief pitch video, which we'll show in turn, and that will be followed by about five minutes of questions and answers. You can answer your questions using the Q&A talk balloon at the, bottom, at the bottom of your screen, and um, Truman will be uh, collating those questions and feeding them to the presenters. So don't forget, please pop your questions into the Q&A box um, as we go along and um, ask really interesting uh, questions of the presenters today. So let's get started. And we will uh, start today with Lane Litz from Chatterize. One moment. Your Good. child spends so much time in English class, and yet without access to an English environment, they have little opportunity to speak. Without speaking practice, children lose confidence and are unable to improve vital communication skills. When they grow up, these same kids are scared to speak out and lack confidence in international environments. We need a solution that empowers all children to speak out. Welcome to Talk Town, a small American town waiting for your child. The citizens of Talktown are always ready for a daily chat. Howdy. Hello. Hi there. Hang out in Talktown for just 10 minutes a day. Each conversation is carefully crafted to replicate real life scenarios to supercharge your child's spoken English. Your child will learn modern words and native sounding phrases. 
communicating in English in the way people really communicate. Your child will perfect their pronunciation and build confidence and fluency Sorry. in speaking. Can you say that again? All while making choices and new storylines as they go. With results in real time, both you and your child will know exactly oh. what to improve. I'm fine, thanks. And you? Loved by thousands of kids and approved by just as many moms. Your Talktown friends are waiting to meet you. See, See you, you soon. soon. So, Lane. Hi, Dave. Well done. Thank you. I was uh, singing along, kind of like dancing along to our background music. Is what I was doing. <laughs> So tell me, Lane, what's um, you know, teaching kids Chinese, uh, sorry, teaching Chinese kids English from New Zealand, um, what possessed you to do that in the first place, and, and how is it going? Yeah, you know, it sounds totally crazy, doesn't it? But the truth is that I and my co-founder, Belisa, we actually spent the last 10 years living and working in China, and specifically in English as a second language learning for kids at what is now the ed tech giant, VIP Kid. So we started at VIP Kid as really founding leadership. I as head of education and teacher services and my co-founder Bell as, teacher, as head of teacher acquisition. And at VIP Kid, what we learned is that the number one reason for the phenomenal growth of that company is that VIP Kid connected Chinese students to uh, North American teachers and the number one reason for purchase was absolutely speaking practice. But there was a big problem here, which is that the premium price point of 25 US dollars, which is almost 40 New Zealand dollars for 25 minutes, actually uh, really prohibits children in third through fifth tier Chinese cities and a lot of kids around the world from using the service, leaving them in the situation they still have no ability to improve their fluency and confidence in spoken English. This is something that Chinese kids study from the age of three all the way to when they finish university and graduate. You know, imagine studying something, Dave, for 18 years or 20 years and graduating, being unable to do it. That's a situation that absolutely needs to be rectified and artificial intelligence has the ability to equalize access to education for all of these children. Right, so are, are many kids using the system? Yeah, absolutely. So last week we just hit 45,000 users having released our product as a WeChat menu program in the middle of February. So we've had some amazing traction. 70% of our growth has come from Chinese third through fifth tier cities as well. Amazing traction in the right market. Uh, and we're very excited to see the user numbers for sure. Hi. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, just uh, in, in China, it's a big country and there are many uh, dialects. So how can your chatbots recognize different accents from different regions in China? Yeah, so we actually don't focus on recognizing different accents from different regions. We, what we focus on as opposed to sounding like a specific thing, like sounding American, right, or sounding like a Kiwi, we focus on intelligibility which is the ability for the student to be understood in English. So really accentedness is not such a big problem for us. The key issue here is intelligibility or helping them improve their pronunciation to the point that they still sound like themselves and yet mm -hmm. can be understood in English. All right. Uh, we have a question here. Is, uh, how do you address IP challenges? IP challenges. Uh, is that, that's a China-centric question. I have a feeling. Uh, how do we address IP challenges? And I'm assuming the meaning of that question is a little bit around what happens if someone copies us and has more money than we do and just steals our idea? What do you think, Truman? Do you think I have uh, the right question here? Well, uh, I think, um, does that happen? Oh. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's happened, right? Absolutely. So uh, our unique competitive advantage really is that we are an international team. Uh, so when I think about China, doesn't every global company want to grab their piece of the Chinese market? First of all, it's very important, right? Secondly, it's a market that we all understand very well, right? So this is what prompted us to get started in China. I think third, we have the network to be able to do it. 
Uh, but when I think about, you know, the roadmap moving forward, international expansion past China is definitely in the books within the next couple of years. And we're looking at Southeast Asia. So high growth, low disposable income economies like Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, that still have this massive willingness to pay for mm -hmm. online English education and yet can't afford tutors for like a one-on-one -on -one or one to three small group English speaking experience. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so we have another question from the audience. Uh, do you notice specific difference in way of learning with Asian kids? Uh, and if yes, what are the patterns? Do we know the specific way of learning? Sorry, right. uh, do you notice specific difference in the way of learning with Asian children? Oh! A uh, specific difference in the way of learning with, with Asian kids. Oh, I've got it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the biggest difference in kind of selling an education product to, to Asia is that Chinese parents truly, truly believe, which is why it's such a total pleasure to sell education or ed tech to China, is that Chinese parents absolutely believe that if their child has a good education, this will improve their life lift them out of poverty, as an example, get them into a good university, right? An international job. Uh, so it's that in the Chinese market, we do not have to work to convince parents that our product is important. Uh, also, Chinese parents are much more willing to sit their kid down, sit down, study this, I don't care if you're having fun, it doesn't really matter to me. Uh, at the same time, we offer a very gamified environment because every parent around the world, including Chinese and Asian parents, don't want to have to do that, right? So there's a lot of motivation and drive, absolutely. Um, and I think the biggest difference for me is that uh, it's easy to sell it, <laughs> right? All right, thanks. Uh, we have an, another question for you from the audience. Uh, is there any B2B tuition center element on the ground? Or is uh -oh. it a digital distribution strategy, B2C? So we are initially, our initial kind of uh, thought here is to go B2C, absolutely. I'm a B2C person, I'll have to be honest with you. Uh, B2C has kind of immediate return on investment, right? Very easy to see data. Whereas B2B, the pipeline's a bit longer. Uh, we find we have to make some concessions around product features to fit with what the businesses want. Um, so we're starting out B2C. At the same time, we do have an authoring system. So what makes it challenging for education companies to go B2B sometimes is that their content has to fit every school's content, right? Which is a challenge. So we do have an authoring system that we will be able to pull out and allow for these offline training centers, for example, to create conversations using our chatbots and our interface that matches with their curriculum, which can be used as a homework solution. Right. Thank you. Uh, yep. That's uh, great, Lane. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time for you yes. right now. So thanks so much for those, uh, for the great video and the really interesting answers. And yeah. Um, yeah, well done. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you all very much. Okay. So now we are moving on to uh, Megan and Digital Badge Ed. Make sure I get the video started correctly this time. Awesome. Great learning is done everywhere, in classrooms, on field trips, at clubs, museums, events, and so on. Learning new things is great. What's not great is the haphazard way this learning gets acknowledged. Ryan gets a certificate for swimming, which he promptly loses, and his mum has to ask for a new one. Lucia receives a shiny plastic trophy for Pony Club that eventually ends up in a landfill. And for learning about her cultural heritage at the museum, Maya just gets a high five. Diverse learning is awesome, but we need a better way to acknowledge, track and share it. That's why we created Digital Badge Ed. A better way to award and track the learning that is done everywhere. Here's how it works. Digital badges take no time to set up and can be created by any school or organisation for any experience or activity that has a learning outcome. You can either choose from our existing library of badges or we can create a custom one just for you. You can use the digital badge as an award that the child then adds to their online collection. 
saw it as an achievement they have to work towards. They will be able to see exactly what each one is for and see evidence of their learning. Having all their digital badges in one place makes it easy for children, teachers and parents to see and acknowledge progress that's been made. Digital badges exist to bring structure and a sense of achievement to the learning that is done everywhere. Click the link below to request your free demo today. Excellent. Hey, thanks so much for that video, Megan. Um, tell me, um, where are you getting the most uh, interest? What sort of subject areas and organizations? Um, I think we're um, focusing our efforts in, in two parts. So one is schools and the other is non-school organisations. So that idea that learning can be done anywhere. Um, we've got some showcase schools, some schools that started up at the beginning of the year. Things went a bit quiet for us over COVID because I think a lot of teachers were already dealing with other uh, really foundational technologies with their classes. Um, but we're really um, just starting to get back into that now. Um, we do have some... Um, more clubs, I guess, and non-profit organisation who are, are starting to use badges. Um, and so we're really trying to do both things, trying to build up both sides of the ecosystem. Cool. And tell, tell me, what, is this, what does this look like at scale? You know, if, if Digital Badge Ed were as big and as wonderful as you wanted it to be, um, what would that look like? I suppose it would look um, like a whole lot of joined up dots, really, because you can, you, you start to get as people travel from one place to another, or they go and visit somewhere. There's all kinds of places that people can can learn, or children can learn. So once we start to combine um, uh, our organisations who um, deliver things online, maybe they do coding or literacy programs. You could put a badge on that. Um, children would go on a field trip to a particular organisation. They're already participating in, in some kind of learning activity. That might have a badge which encapsulates those learning outcomes. Um, and then as, as they sort of travel, I, I guess they can start to um, access badges wherever they're going. Cool. Thanks so much, Megan. Uh, uh, over, over to you, Truman. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, Megan. We have a, a question from the audience. Um, is blockchain part of your tech stack? Uh, blockchain is something that we have um, certainly considered and we've, we're certainly keeping um, up with what's happening there. Um, when I first started pulling this together, um, I was asked whether, the, whether we were putting everything on the blockchain. And at that time, and I still feel that it's still quite early days for blockchain and we've already got enough technology, I think, and enough newness to, to be putting out there. So I think our, our intention is definitely that there could come a time where we put those assertions um, onto the blockchain, which would... Um, be the right place for them in a long-term way. Right. And another question is, is, that, uh, is there a post-secondary element too, or is the focus on K-12? Um, yeah, I think micro-credentials or digital badges are um, traditionally are, are being used for adult learners. So we're seeing that qualification um, focus at tertiary or even at corporate level. Um, we've, our, I guess our innovation is to take the mechanism of a digital badge and apply it at that younger age. But certainly this generation of, of um, young children will, by the time they get to the end of their secondary school, I'm sure they will be earning their qualifications by some form of micro-credential. So our intention is to, um, I guess, extend our backpack just to end, and we can already with the platform um, issue badges to learners of any age. It's really up to the issuing organisation. Um, but yeah, we sort of see, that, see ourselves being able to follow them all the way through. Right. Another question is, that, uh, can we convert them into real credits? Into real credits? Uh, I don't think the, the, given our focus is primary and middle school, I'm not sure that that, um, that would be the use case in, um, for, for those types of badges, but it's really up to issuing organisations to work through how they're going to structure their badge and how that would translate into um, NZQA type credits. But um, yeah, that, that would probably be something to ask them. Right, yes. So, uh, what types of things are you doing to engage and assign the children to earn the badges? What types of things to engage and excite them? I guess yeah. um, the interesting thing is that the mechanism of a digital badge, it's visual, it's collectible, so it already appeals to kids. I think what I've seen with um, my children and their friends is that although we still give out a lot of physical tokens like certificates and trophies, mm. um, they're not valued for very long. Um, I think that they, the certificates get crumpled up, the, the trophies and medals get lost. 
And I think even if organizations want to continue giving out that physical token, it's really valuable to also recognize that learning in a digital way because that's far more relevant for kids. So once they've got this digital recognition, they can then uh, they can generate their own certificate, but also they can share that to their blog or to Seesaw or whatever's going on in their classroom. Um, right. Yeah. So another question from, from the audience, uh, who are your competitors? Um, competitors, I guess we are based on the open badges format. So, um, you know, we're certainly not the only um, platform that delivers digital badges, but most of the focus at the moment has been on, um, on the tertiary and, and corporate uh, market. So I think we are um, reasonably unique in focusing on primary and middle school aged kids. Um, there are probably some uh, student management systems or learning management systems that are looking at, at putting in badges. Um, but what we're trying to do is really focus on just the badges and build the ecosystem. So our argument would be that actually they could plug into our system, they could consume our APIs. Um, and what they'd be doing is ensuring that the badges that they deliver um, for the child are part of a wider portfolio. So instead of a child having to go to all these different places in order to access their badges, we can, through our, our backpack, we can help them to um, organize them into their own place. Right. Yeah. Yep. And another question, um, is the problem you are trying to solve relevant outside of New Zealand? Yeah, definitely. I, th I think um, badges are, and the concept is, is really universal. Um, so I think we've talked, or the video talked a lot about our earners and, and the benefits for them being about, I can see my progress, you know, I can take responsibility for my own learning, I can see as, as things are being marked off and I hold my credentials in my digital portfolio. The value for uh, the other organisations is really the data. So we can, what we're hearing from organisations is that they want to increase the breadth and depth of their engagement with kids. So instead of a single event, they want to kind of go, how could we put a badge on it and, and um, extend that? Um, use. So we can also provide metrics. It's like if you're providing an, an educational program for kids, how do you know that it's making, um, having that impact? So we can actually start to measure um, how many kids are enrolled, how are they progressing, what's the time lapse, how many badges are being given out. Um, Thank you, Megan. That's great. Thanks so much, Megan. And um, I want some of the other founders to be listening here tonight because I can see how Digital Badge Ed might fit in really well uh, with Chatterize, it could fit in with Ocean Browser, uh, it could fit in with Accounting Pod, and so you guys should really talk to each other and figure out how you can integrate with each other's products. It'd be really cool. Speaking of Accounting Pod, um, our next uh, next presenter uh, this evening is uh, Judith Cambridge, and uh, we'll just uh, show her video now. One second. Kia Accounting Pod. We are a team of experienced chartered accountants, engineers, designers, and content creators. We're passionate about education technology for business education. Today, businesses and organizations of all sizes connect and collaborate to create our dynamic digital economy. Yet we saw a critical skills gap between the textbook driven classroom and technology enabled business of today. Educators and regulators agree. We must prepare today's learners with employability skills for their digital future. Accounting pod. We've built the technology to connect the thousands of learners from our B2B customers to the business ecosystem with hands-on case studies providing realistic data and current business context across cloud accounting platforms. We call this plug and play because learn by doing is one of the best ways to build employability skills. Accounting Pod delivers for teachers a smart, learning layer, we can deploy SSO from your LMS to wrap around leading accounting and business platforms used by employers in your region. Accounting Pod delivers for students, 
hands-on learning through unique learning experiences supported with instant task feedback by our robot. Today, let's take a look at our Power BI solution. We're a young New Zealand edtech, delivering hands-on learning to our educator users globally. If your institution's learners need employability skills on leading cloud accounting and business platforms, get in touch with us for a demo and a free trial. Nā mihi. Thanks so much for that, Judith. Uh, great video and um, really is a really interesting um, proposition. So tell me, Judith, how do you measure the um, education outcomes that you're achieving um, with the students that are going through Accounting Pod? Um, do they like, you know, do you have a certain percentage of them that uh, achieve employment or uh, increase uh, job earnings or better job skills or how, how do you measure the outcomes? Um, for most of the deliveries, Dave, we are actually uh, setting up feedback sessions. So we're very much at the stage of a feedback loop uh, for the student uh, satisfaction. And then in terms of where did they go to from there, um, we are, because we're a B2B model, uh, we work with the university who is looking at um, collecting those metrics themselves and uh, have their own internal uh, feedback loop. So they'll liaise back with us as well uh, when they are wanting to run a session and, um, and let us know uh, where the students have got to. Yeah. Thanks, Judith. What are you, Truman? Nice. Um, uh, there's a question for you from audience. Uh, Judith, uh, what assigned you about accounting education? <laughs> well, um, interestingly, uh, many students have thought that accounting is boring, right? Uh, and in the world that I work in, it, it's far from that because today with the robots, are creating our business solutions and smart um, reporting, uh, i.e., you know, the use of a platform like Zero and others that gather around it over 400, right? How can the world of business and accounting be boring, right? It, and it needs to engage our new minds beyond uh, bookkeeping, beyond journals. And uh, realistically, uh, that's where the um, students actually do start on paper, writing journals uh, at their university for their level. Um, it's changing, but it's changing slowly. So, you know, I'm excited about the digital opportunity here. Right. Yes. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, what is the problem you are solving for the market? <laughs> I'm not sure if anyone's been into a, an accounting or business classroom of late, um, but the reality is that many are still using a textbook and the application of that learning uh, doesn't actually happen. So we're closing the gap between the theory of the textbook and current business practice. And um, what's fortunate is in terms of timing, this is a global issue. You wouldn't send a, a you wouldn't send a doctor or a dentist or a, um, and even a lawyer, right? Out into a workplace without some kinds of hands-on training on the tools of their profession. That actually happens in the business schools. Uh, they go out into the marketplace with no hands-on application uh, uh, and that's where Accounting Pod is excited to solve uh, this need of the digital age. Right. So is it just for university or is it also, is it also for secondary school? 
Uh, so right now we are delivering across the spectrum of uh, to university uh, vocational providers and the schools who, who have strictly prescribed curriculum are requesting this experience for students. Mm. It's interesting, times have now changed, right? Uh, regulators are asking for evidence of this learning, not just trying a free platform like many lecturers might uh, look at a free version of something and get their students to do something. Uh, but the evidence of their work on the platform uh, can't be collected in that way. And how do you, anyway, um, guide and monitor and individualise uh, that student learning for any cloud platform uh, so that you can um, have academic integrity in that delivery? So we're really excited about what can be done as we connect across uh, the cloud. Thank you, Judith. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, sounds like you're um, operating in uh, quite a few countries and touching lots of students all over the world and helping them become better at what they do. So thanks oh, so much days. on behalf of all of those students. <laughs> early days, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's exciting. Thanks very much. Right, now our uh, next presenter uh, this evening is Rodney Tamblin from OB3, Ocean Browser. Here we go. Gloria needs to prepare an online class for Monday. She only has an hour. How can OB3 speed this process up for her? She already has some content. A Word doc from last year's course is a good start. Transferring into OB3 is a snap. She checks everything came in correctly. Cleaning up things along the way using OB3 editing speeches. An image for the start would be nice. And there's a video and a quote to add. PowerPoint slides have useful content. There's a diagram. She'd like to get her students involved through discussions. Finally, there's a course feedback form. Three, beautiful study for lifelong learning. Engage students, empower teachers. Thanks so much for that, Rodney. That uh, looks really great. It's like a uh, WordPress for education or um, uh, Google Docs for classrooms, for classroom teachers. And I bet you everyone who uh, has ever had to use Moodle or Blackboard is just drooling at the moment. Um, we get so, a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so tell us, um, how do you compete against Moodle and Blackboard and you know the other the other big providers because they just have such tremendous market pull in internationally. 
we tend to find that if, if anything they're actually uh, a source of business because as you say they're they don't provide a very good experience for uh, for they're not very engaging or useful for the teachers in terms of the authoring process but they're also not a great place to collaborate so being able to support different types of co-creation and collaboration activities and discussion activities um, really opens that scope up so the uh, the video today is sort of showing the authoring side of thing but that's as much for the students as part of their creative process as it is for the teachers as part of their process and i should mention i have my co-founder uh, Gloria Gomez who's the, the designer of the product here with us as well tonight. When, when Rodney talks, hello everyone, um, when Rodney mentions co-creation, uh, this, this idea, this, the philosophical idea underpinning OV3, we started selling to, into medical education and what we noticed with medical educators is that at some point they are teachers but also they go back to become a students in the span of their professional career. So our first clients, the people we started working with, um, um, these are people that are lifelong learners. So sometimes doctors are actually teaching, but other times they are studying, which means that the technology has to actually accommodate for that type of social interaction when it comes to learning. So OB3 documents, actually we have one place for teacher and students to work together and they can change the role in the document. Uh, also, what we notice in the process is that uh, when students are contributing discussions embedded in the document, the discuss discussions actually help teachers to modify the way they present the lecture, which means that sometimes even the lecturing material is less and the student contribution is more, and that enhances the, the student center part of our what our technology empowers. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that over time courses evolve, they might start off very curriculum driven and then three or four years later, they moved more towards a collaborative model. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question, uh, several questions from the audience. So uh, what are your future plans for the product? So one of the things we're working on at the moment is uh, a lightweight mobile tablet and web publishing view for OB3 content that has accessibility features and, and lots of options for getting the content out and using it in different types of ways. So some of our customers are building uh, innovative uh, uh, medical or education apps and they want to take some of the knowledge that they've got inside OB3 in different communities of practice and connect it into those apps. Or they might be wanting to have seamless embedding of the content in OB3 inside other environments or learning systems that they're using. So we're providing that, uh, some of those features. And the, another area that we're working on, I'll let Gloria mention, which is around the coaching side of um, coaching for performance. Uh, yeah, but that's in early stages in around uh, in learning analytics. The idea is that to develop a type of environment uh, that connects with OV3 where uh, the system kind of coaches people into their learning process or their teaching process, you know, but yeah, early days of that is coaching, you know, coaching for study performance. But uh, yeah, we are working into that as well. All right. So the audience like the music in your video. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, another question from the audience is, are you working closely with any major publishers? Uh, pub uh, I have some connections uh, into publishers um, through uh, an accelerator program we went through in, in, in London a few years ago. Uh, so we've, we've got some, some, uh, some doors open there, but uh, we are we, we kind of want to stay closer to learners and teachers uh, so and independent educators and business. That, those are the sort of markets that we're working with today. Yeah, we are actually very keen to uh, support self-publishing. You know, every person who knows how to, who has basic digital skills to create OB3 documents and then self-publish some of that. And we feel that once uh, people have self-published their material a little bit and have shared it with our community, the more formal publishing environments or companies, you know, will connect. We will find a way to connect with them. But mm -hmm. we are very keen is to empower every person because if you come to think about it, most of us are teachers at some point and also learners at some point. So that's the last lifelong learning cycle. Everyone is a teacher, everyone is a student. And, and at the moment we are focusing in formal education, but what we are seeing, there is an interest for informal learning and also for non-formal education as well. 
Thank you, Rodney and Gloria. Uh, there are uh, several more questions, but I think we are running out of time. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, thanks yeah. so much, Rodney. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no, it's, uh, your system's come a long way over the last few years, and, um, and uh, it sounds like uh, your customer base has as well. Really great to see you. So thanks again for presenting tonight. Okay. Now, our next presenter is Kyle from LitMaps. Helping us visualize human knowledge. The capacity to educate ourselves is fundamentally reliant on tools that allow us to uh, discover and navigate high quality information. We can see from existing technologies uh, like Google search uh, and Wikipedia, uh, the enormous potential for these technologies to increase uh, educational opportunities around the world. We need these technologies because the scale of information that we're trying to make sense of is so large uh, and increasing so rapidly. Um, we can look at one example of this uh, in the uh, scientific research literature, that is scientific studies published over time. Uh, this is a map of uh, scientific research published between the year 1400 and 2019. Uh, and we can see that uh, this is very much on an exponential curve uh, and is not slowing down anytime soon. Uh, this uh, represents uh, 100 million scientific publications. Uh, and so that's a um, very significant challenge to navigate, both if you are uh, trying to teach um, an area, but also if you're trying to add new knowledge uh, in that you have to understand uh, what's happened before um, so that you're well-placed to uh, make a new contribution. Uh, and so uh, one uh, way to try and tackle this problem is through new information technology tools. However, we have to be careful when we're doing this um, to uh, navigate risks and biases, uh, which we're starting to see in machine learning driven tools, for example. LitMaps approaches this problem through network science, uh, more specifically in this case, uh, the citation network. So while there's a hundred million articles here, uh, there are over a billion citation connections uh, linking ideas across time. Uh, and so LitMaps is building uh, tools to help to navigate um, the science literature from that network. Uh, to give one example, uh, we have completed a um, combined keyword search and uh, network traversal search engine. Um, and what that is, is you start with a keyword search, uh, you then take uh, good outputs from that, good results from that, and bring them into a network search process that allows you to navigate the citation network and identify more and more relevant uh, research to you um, giving you better results um, and allowing you to contextualize um, the information that you're taking in. This is part of a broader vision to uh, empower people uh, to better understand uh, that huge body of information and its potential to add value uh, to the lives of people all over the world. Right. Thanks so much for that, Kyle. Hey, um, uh, just reminding people to enter their questions into the Q&A box. Um, tell us what's the most surprising thing that you've learned in one of your deep dives through the literature uh, as you've been going through LitMaps? <laughs> um, sure. So uh, in the LitMaps team, we come from different backgrounds. Um, so my background is as a scientist, um, but there's uh, one of our co-founders who's um, got a design background um, and also works on some of our front-end development. Um, he uh, decided that um, for all of his testing, his area of interest would be pizza. Um, and so for every single test search that he did to see if the system was working correctly, he would search for articles about pizza. Um, and there's one particular favorite, pizza, pizza, pizza. Um, so he's become an expert in that domain now and understands the um, development of pizza science over time. <laughs> so. Um, I found that people bring whatever <laughs> interest they have to the system and explore it in that way. Yeah, quite bizarre. <laughs> yes, thanks. Over to you, Truman. Yep. Uh, thank you. And, uh, Kai, Kai uh, there are several questions from the audience. Uh, mm -hmm. What is your business model? What's that business and, model? Yep. Yeah, sure. Um, so we uh, are selling, in the first instance, um, directly to researchers. Um, so um, there are a lot of products out there that serve the institution, um, so a, a university or a um, research centre, 
our um, sort of value set and our um, path to market is to deliver value directly to the researcher, um, particularly postdoctoral level researchers, so sort of scientists who are just sort of starting out on their career, um, and they've got enough sort of um, control over purchasing decisions to chuck something for you know six eight hundred bucks on the um, department credit card. Um, so that's the user that we're targeting, and that's the the way we make money. Yeah, and it's a SaaS business. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, can you describe how uh, lead maps could help people make sense of the huge amount of research happening? For example, uh, research about COVID nineteen at the moment. Yeah, sure. Um, so COVID-19 is an interesting example because uh, there's a huge depth of coronavirus research that's taken place. Coronavirus is actually quite a broad class of viruses. Um, and so the question is, can we leverage that huge amount of existing information to address this very immediate uh, problem at the moment of um, building solutions for COVID? Um, and that can enter into a number of different domains. So as a researcher, you might be interested in the epidemiology, you might be interested in the structural biology, or you might be interested in, say, vaccine development. Um, what the product that I demonstrated uh, in that video does is it allows you to take that broad search and begin to drive the search process in an active way. So by your selections, um, you are uh, sort of driving it towards one of those areas. Um, and you're doing that in a way that comes without some of the problems that machine learning driven recommendation engines bring in, things like bias um, uh, that is not transparent. Uh, so that's one way that it can help. Mm -hmm. So is it difficult to sell to academics? And how can your company change the work for the better? Uh, is it difficult to sell to academics? Is that the first question, sorry? Yeah, yeah. Is, it, is it difficult yeah. to sell to academics? And yeah, how can your company, so, sorry. <laughs> I would say it's challenging to sell to universities, um, to, to research institutions is like a terrible, horrible sales cycle. Um, however, um, to sell to academics themselves, if you bring the right type of value and you understand what drives them, um, particularly around publication um, and around their objectives there, um, then you can definitely sell into that market. And there are good New Zealand examples of that um, with companies uh, like Biomatters and their product Genius has done very well in the molecular biology market, for example. Yeah. Um, sorry, what was the second part of the question? Yep. How can your company change the world for the better? Oh, okay. Um, so the way I, I sometimes look at this is that there are a huge array of problems that, that face um, people around the world. Um, and usually there's uh, a group of researchers working on those problems. Uh, and so uh, whether you care about um, say medical advances, so you care particularly about Alzheimer's or whether you're really passionate about space exploration, if we can improve the information infrastructure that's supporting those researchers, uh, then we can accelerate their progress and that way have a very broad benefit um, across many areas. Yeah. Great. I think there are many more questions, but I think uh, we're running out of time. So it's over to you, Dave. Thank you very much, Kai. Thank you. Thank you, Truman. Thank you, Kyle. Really great to see your product developing. And uh, yeah, it's uh, so important to be able to understand that citation network. It, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger with every passing day. So I think your tool is really valuable and really look forward to it being successful. Thank you. Right. So now we move on to our final presenter tonight, who is uh, Ali Mezraha from the Arabic Digital Reform Institute. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Ali Mazre. I'm the CEO and co-founder of uh, the Arabic Digital Reform Institute. We call ourselves uh, ADRI. And uh, the transliteration of that uh, in Arabic uh, means I know. The reason uh, for choosing that identity and claiming I know uh, is that um, our vision is to transform uh, research uh, production and research consumption in the Arabic uh, language to, uh, to the modern day technologies. Now, um, we discovered that uh, the amount of uh, research material, and, and this is every manuscript, including articles, thesis, and everything that we see uh, in the university's libraries, uh, that doesn't exist in the Arabic language. Uh, a very small proportion of uh, the academic subjects 
uh, would be uh, one or two articles in Arabic, uh, modern uh, articles, of course. But uh, majority of uh, the academic subjects uh, don't, uh, don't be even one uh, article uh, in the Arabic language. And uh, this is wh while um, the majority of uh, the Arabic speakers' uh, population, they don't uh, speak English or uh, English is, uh, is not their strongest um, uh, media. Now, um, that, that could, uh, that, uh, the impact of such a dilemma could uh, extend beyond simply just education and goes all the way to the social, political, economical and all different aspects of um, the populations in the MENA region. So we, we got together, we did um, a few years of research, uh, we had um, an immense amount of support at, uh, uh, at Victoria University and um, uh, others in Wellington and New Zealand until we got to uh, the um, suitable design uh, and we built the system. The system uh, harvests uh, uh, open source research from academic repositories in English at scale and we tr uh, translate that via machine learning and AI. And uh, once uh, the translation completed, then we pass it to a quality assurance system where actual academics go into that system and review the uh, items one by one before releasing to our platform. And the platform is available for subscription to universities uh, with a fraction of, um, uh, of the cost. Uh, now, uh, that has uh, gained quite a bit of uh, um, uh, interest in the region and we just closed our first deal with the Ministry of Culture in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's a multi-million um, dollar uh, project uh, and spans across three years. Uh, we are a proud uh, Kiwi brand and um, everyone is excited about what we do at the moment in the region. Thanks so much for that, Ali. Uh, what an exciting time to be talking to you uh, as you're uh, as you're closing your your first major deal. Um, Thank you, uh, Ali. Tell us uh, what's the New Zealand connection. It seems like New Zealand driving uh, the Arabic language in the Middle East. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. This is this is the most common question I get uh, in the region as well, particularly with our um, interest parties and stakeholders. Uh, and the answer, to be honest, Dave, why not New Zealand? Um, uh, well, what a better place. Uh, we have the inclusive and uh, egalitarian uh, culture. We have the talents, uh, particularly, and on the production of myself and the rest of the uh, co founding team, uh, production of uh, a product of that uh, system. So um, I think uh, it's the modern uh, day that uh, there's no borders, particularly uh, not physical and not even the in the identity um, uh, perspective. And in New Zealand, we had the um, blessing that um, we cared about the others and we cared about um, diversity particularly. So kind of, um, I am from, uh, from uh, the region originally, but I'm a proud uh, citizen in uh, New Zealand too. And uh, kind of like that, I created the um, connection in my uh, mind and my end but uh, the support that I, uh, the overwhelming support that I received in New Zealand um, got us to this point at the moment as well. So um, tell us a little bit about your intellectual property. I mean, you know, machine translation is done by, you know, Google and Microsoft, and it seems like everyone's working on a, on a, on a translation engine. What's, what's, the, what's the secret sauce that Adria has? Absolutely. So I have to uh, definitely um, emphasize that uh, our translation at the moment is in, in uh, uh, partnership with AWS. We went on and created our own algorithms and created our own uh, translation engine. But uh, frankly, um, the amount of data required for getting competitive in that sense to the rest of uh, uh, the providers in the um, in the re in the market uh, was quite difficult for us as a startup. So we just partnered with AWS on that particular part. However. Uh, there is a, um, a plethora of uh, different uh, systems and algorithms that we uh, implemented uh, ar around the translation engine, particularly to shorten the translation cycle. Um, as you could appreciate, um, simply uh, running a Google Translate will show uh, how much work is required beyond simply just the translation. And uh, what we created, we uh, automated a lot of um, those particular editorial uh, tasks but also um, 
the uh, integration, the formatting, the visual side of, uh, um, of uh, a whole operation that we could uh, uh, confidently say uh, that the whole transition cycle is now uh, in our systems is between 90 to 96 uh, percent lower than uh, manual translation as well. Yep. All right. Uh, Thanks for that. Everybody, Truman? Yep. Uh, we have a question for you from the audience. Um, have you ever considered switching to an NGO as opposed to for-profit company? Absolutely. So to be honest, we started uh, as a um, as a, a, a R&D um, NGO uh, project. We didn't really want to um, go commercial because we, we do feel the impact is quite significant. And we got a, a, an immense amount of interest and support. But um, uh, I think um, uh, my um, uh, NGO uh, panelists uh, in, in here as well could acknowledge that. And, and uh, that is the challenge of sustaining NGOs operations, particularly such a global uh, operations. We are running from uh, New Zealand, uh, uh, targeting a region of 17 hours flight uh, distance. Uh, by itself is quite uh, challenging, so uh, we uh, we felt it couldn't really sustain itself in the long run. We 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 were um, as a, a social enterprise and R and D uh, um, institute. That's why we call ourselves an institute. Uh, for the first three years, until later on, we felt okay. Let's um, uh, give it to the um, to the commercial world and uh, try to sustain it. And and actually, our pricing is uh, to that uh, uh, to that end particularly as well it's very constrained with the impact uh, that we're making right so uh, is there any ambition to expand to another language beyond arabic um, absolutely so the systems um, we created uh, they have the applicability to um, be utilized in every uh, uh, what we call uh, language pairs uh, you, it can be from English to any other language or from any other language to um, um, English or and, and, other, and vice versa. The focus at the moment for us, particularly because of the impact that very nicely the previous question was alluding to uh, uh, as well, uh, is on the Arabic language because of uh, the gap, because of the significant gap and uh, the lack of uh, research in particular in that language. However, um, we, we do have in our uh, plans and the strategy for the future that we might be thinking of licensing the technology and uh, the IP around it to other languages, or even um, uh, maybe we have uh, the time and uh, the resources to actually do it ourselves also for other languages. But this is on the long run as well. All right. Thank you very much, Ali. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for asking the questions to the presenters. Uh, it's over to you, Dave. Uh, thanks so much, Truman. So um, I think that wraps it up. Uh, thanks so much, Ali, and to uh, all of the presenters uh, this afternoon. Um, as I said at the beginning, it just goes to show how vibrant and interesting uh, the New Zealand education technology space is. Um, we can all help each other. Uh, we may be a team of five million New Zealanders, but it seems like you know we're a team of a couple of hundred ed techs. And um, you know, it's great to be out there celebrating uh, what we've achieved together and what we're all doing in our interest, interesting stuff in our own spheres. So I will urge people, if you're interested in uh, education technology, uh, go over to edtechnz.org.nz. Uh, keep up uh, with what the sector is doing and find out ways that you can get involved and help each other. So that completes this uh, webinar. Thanks again. It's been a wonderful week. Uh, and um, we hope to see you soon. Kia ora. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dave.